I wasn't upset when I got the call last week. Honestly, I was kind of expecting it. Surprised it hadn't happened earlier, really. The old man had been fighting off heart trouble for years, and it finally got the best of him. The hospital that he passed away at called me in to confirm who he was, and the funeral arrangements had already been taken care of in his will. Now all there was to do was pack up his house. I know, I know, it seems kind of cold for me to talk about him like this. He was my father after all. Truth is, he wasn't much of a father other than a name. He was constantly pouring himself into his work, almost never home. And when he was, he was distant or asleep, usually passing out on the couch by noon on his days off. He didn't talk about his work much, said that it was classified. I just know that he worked in some lab, studying quantum something or other. I didn't hold any of that against him at first, not until I was 14, when I got home from school and found my mother collapsed in the kitchen. I had tried shaking her and doing chest compressions, anything that may bring her back, but she was cold to the touch already when I had found her. Her eyes had the white film over them that death brings, and she was stiff, not easily moved. I called Dad three times with no answer, before I finally gave up and I called 911 to report what had happened. When they got her in for autopsy, it was discovered that she had an aneurysm. Completely random, no way to predict or stop it. A nurse consoled me at the hospital as they wheeled her body into the morgue. They tried to call my dad too, but had as much luck as me. He finally showed up two days later, looking like he had been through a bender that would make Charlie Sheen jealous. He mumbled something about it, being sorry and sleepwalked through the funeral. After that, it was business as usual, with me fending for myself while he worked. Naturally, I got away from there as soon as possible. I went off to a good college, got a scholarship and a full ride through and I'm currently finishing up my doctorate degree. Things have been stressful. It's a doctorate, I don't know what I had expected, but I'm managing. I made the arrangements with my professors to take a couple of weeks off of class while I closed everything out back home. And here we are now. Stepping back into my childhood home was surprising, really. The place looked immaculate. Just a small layer of dust on everything. It almost looked like he hadn't come back home since I left eight years ago. Hell, he probably hadn't. Probably just stayed at the lab and crashed in a bench or something when he was tired. At least this would make packing up and cleaning easy. I got to work, cleaning out the kitchen first, and then slowly making my way further into the house. His bedroom was the last to go, and I took a deep breath as I entered. There was not a single thing out of place. The same bed, dresser, and lamp that he had had since I was born. Still in the same place after all these years. The only thing that was strange was the box sitting on his bed. I noticed there was writing on top as I moved towards it, making it out to say, For Mark, as I drew closer. So this bastard couldn't call or write for eight years after I left home. But he could leave a box sitting here, completely sealed before he goes through heart failure. I felt a small tinge of rage build up in my chest. Hot fire pushing up through my throat. God, the last thing I needed was for my stress ulcers to start up during all of this. I grabbed the box cutter from the kitchen table and I sat down on the bed. The box was heavy, packed full but perfectly stacked to fill out every inch of space. What the hell could he have left after all this time? Upon opening the flaps of cardboard, I saw stacks upon stacks of old VHS tapes. Each one was meticulously labeled with a name, date, and a five-digit number underneath that. On the top of all of it was a letter from my dad. Mark, I just want to tell you how sorry I am. There's no excuse that I can make. Nothing I can say will take back how awful I've been, 
but I want you to know that I'm truly sorry. I was absorbed in my work until your mother died. I didn't even think of being part of this family. When she was gone, it just hurt too much to be here. And so, I lost myself even further in my work, trying to make sense of everything that had happened and what had yet to happen. I wanted to tell your mother how sorry I was as well. There are things I've never been able to tell you. My work, most of my life, they've been kept secrets from those that I love most. You see, Mark, I work for something called The Collective. We monitor events out of the ordinary and try to keep them from happening again. What this mostly includes is keeping an eye on parallel universes, making sure the walls between our world and theirs stay intact. I thought I was pouring myself into my work to protect you from these things, Mark. There are creatures beyond our imagination that have come to our world from others, things only some of us can see without help. This is my research. Sure, it isn't quite everything, but it's what I could manage to get out of the lab. For the past 30 years, I've been monitoring other worlds for apocalyptic events, hoping to study what happens there in order to help prevent such an event here. Each of these tapes contain an emergency broadcast or some other bulletin from a now extinct world, as well as a detailed report on what had happened. There's a lot of technical speak for how we got these, but I'll leave that for another time or later. With all that said, please continue my work. Help to ensure the survival of our world. I won't make you do this, but I ask with everything left in me. I leave this box of tapes, some horrifying, some tragic, and to ask you that you look through them. See if you can find patterns that I haven't. When you've decided you want to do this and research more, find the collective, speak with the cognizant, and they'll be waiting for you. I love you, son. I'm sorry. Dad. I couldn't believe any of this. Had he been struggling with dementia before he died? Was he schizophrenic? God, I couldn't believe I was actually about to watch one of these tapes. I dug out our old VCR from storage and I plugged it up into the TV, grabbing the first tape off the top of the stack. Inside the sleeve with the tape was an envelope containing a few slips of paper. I put the video in, sat down on the floor and started looking over the report. 12 1975 Spider Baby Earth 02-258 Broadcast interrupted by cognizant enhanced airwaves during late night movie hour on local broadcast television. Cognizant on duty was Ralph, who said that during interdimensional surveillance, he noticed a bright flash around 10.17 p.m., after which a phenomena began. Cognizant reported that multitudes of people began materializing in the streets. Subjects appear to be human but do not speak or communicate in any human manner. Cognizant reports that subjects look ranged from preteen children to senior citizens of both genders. Subjects began by approaching people on the street. When approached, they will stand in front of native humans and study them, before multi-jointed appendages jut from their backs of the subjects, impaling the humans in question. Once they have impaled the humans, they then begin to absorb them slowly, while the victim is still alive. Kind is then quickly linked with collective of the victim world, warning them of the situation. Emergency broadcast was sent out not long after that. Kind is then continued recon, noting that once these streets were cleared, the subjects began knocking on doors and feeding on anyone that opened their door. This continued for hours after. Cognizant eventually had to be forcefully removed from recon due to the mental toll of seeing unprecedented death. Second Cognizant, Agatha, then took over. Notice that as the creatures absorbed more humans, the variety of people they appeared as grew. 
made sure to note one house in particular where a toddler aged girl knocked on the door and then proceeded to grow multiple limbs much like those of an arachnid and absorb a family of four on its own. As these subjects absorbed more and more victims, they began to grow and merge into a seeming collective. Cognizant noted that creatures operated on a hive mind with one singular goal of feeding and merging. Cognizant continued to watch events unfold, switching out in shifts for five days until the subjects had fed enough. Once this was done, all subjects vanished, appearing at a point above Central America and merging into one over the course of five hours. Once they emerged, the subject showed its true form. Cognizant described it as still humanoid, though with armor plating like that of an arthropod, with human limbs and six more segmented legs rising from the spinal area. Creatures reported to have large mandibles, as well as four red eyes. Creature pierced the earth below it with all six segmented limbs, each one landed in a different area of North and South America. From here, the creature nested for four more days, curling its main body into a tight ball, while these segmented limbs held it up. Humanity of this respective earth attempted to fight back, but nothing was able to break the plating. Midway through the fourth day, it was determined the creature was feeding on the energy of the earth. Fault lines began to appear from the spot each limb landed and move out from there. Cognizant reported the patterns of spiderwebs made by the lines. At the end of the four days, the earth was in a serious drought, with ocean levels dropping by nearly 400 feet. Finally, the planet shattered in on itself leaving segments of broken earth swirling in the atmosphere where a whole planet once stood. Cognizant Agatha and Ralph are currently on leave and on suicide watch due to high mental strain. We'll update as more info becomes available. Update 1-8-1976 Ralph found dead in dormitory this morning, bashed his head against the dorm wall until unconscious. Brain trauma was too much for revival. Agatha had covered her dormitory walls in paintings of large arachnids. There is a black widow spider nested in the corner of her room. Upon the janitor attempting to remove the spider, Agatha attacked him, claiming that he would anger the arachnid god. Jesus Christ, I couldn't believe what I had just seen or read. I knew the movie. It was Spider Baby, an old bee horror from the 60s. But halfway through, the film This Emergency Alert broadcast came up, telling everyone to stay indoors and to not answer any knocks on their door. Maybe Dad wasn't crazy. Maybe he's just messing with me from the afterlife, and he edited these himself. Maybe I'm the crazy one, and I worked myself into a freaking breakdown this semester. I'm going to transfer the warning part of the video over to digital and try to upload it. Maybe that'll help me make sense of all of this. I don't know if I want to watch any more of these tapes, but I feel like I have to. There's got to be some kind of thread linking everything. There must be some way to stop these events from happening here. I transfer the video. Here it is. I'm going to try to go through the rest of these tapes in the next few months, but I think I'll need to take it slow. My head is spinning as is. Take care, everyone, and I'll keep you updated.
I'm going to be honest right off the bat with everyone. I didn't want to make this update. I don't want to keep this up. I want to destroy these goddamn tapes and lobotomize myself. I want to forget any of this ever happened. I want to forget that I ever had a father. I've gone through a few more of the tapes as well as the case files contained with them. Some were uneventful. Just a news broadcaster, late night film with a stock emergency broadcast system message. One warned of an impending meteor strike and then went to static. One just cut off in the middle of an old cartoon. No message or anything. It turns out that one was a universe where a black hole suddenly formed somewhere between Mercury and Venus, collapsing the entire solar system in fractions of a second. No pain, no mass. Just something to nothing. All of this though, it's taking a toll. Looking at all of this death and destruction, all these untold horrors that lurk out there in the world, there has to be something out there to counterbalance this. For every world that ends violently, there has to be some world where they found the cure for cancer or ended world hunger, right? God, I hope so. Otherwise, what I have here is a box full of nihilism and analog tape. I've been doing a little more research into what Dad said in his letter as well. These cognizants, that's what they keep getting referred to as anyway. They can apparently see into other dimensions, and see interdimensional beings in our own world. Apparently on occasion, the walls between realities will tear and things will slip through. In most of the reports I've seen, they're referred to as aberrations. Dad has a couple of files in here about a near apocalyptic event months ago, caused by some tearing into our world. I'm going to transcribe a couple more of the case files now. I tried my best to get the tapes transferred over to digital, but some of them are so old that they didn't make it. The ones I did get were attached to old movie reruns on late night TV again. Night of the Living Dead and Carnival of Souls. At least the other realities still have good movies, I guess. 10-18-1977 Case Night of the Living Dead Earth 24-601 Kindness on duty today is Agatha, for the most part recovered from her trauma earlier this year. Still protects whatever spider she can find, but has managed to let us take the brown recluses to a safe area. She does not realize that this entails Robin throwing them in the incinerator. Tuned Universal Surveillance over to Earth 24-601, where Agatha said tensions between the United States and Communist Russia were highly elevated. Also mentioned that Vietnam was still ongoing as well with much higher casualties to American troops as well, as deployment of a new uranium-based biological weapon, codenamed Agent Green. The American military, desiring to bring a swift and decisive end to the Vietnam conflict, as well as to intimidate potential enemies, decided to drop a hydrogen bomb on Hishomi City. The devastation of the blast is immeasurable, leveling the entire city as well as most of the surrounding countryside. An unintended effect soon follows, 
However, that will bring about the end. The nuclear capability of the hydrogen bomb reacts with compounds in Agent Green that have been sprayed throughout the Vietnamese jungle. This causes any disease that were not immediately evaporated by the blast to begin to mutate, rising from the dead into a reanimated state. Mutations typically consisted of grotesque boils growing on exposed patches of skin, extra teeth growing on arms, legs, and in a few observed cases, stomachs of the deceased. Subjects typically wandered aimlessly once reanimated, roaming the countryside and ruins of the city until they came in contact with anyone still living. Upon seeing the living being, they would grow into a frenzy with the singular goal of attacking and capturing the live victim, upon which they would pull them in close, lacerating skin with the exposed teeth and then popping the boils, allowing the pus to seep into the victim. This in turn infected the living victim, who would first die a slow, painful death, much like that observed in victims of radiation poisoning after the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They would begin the mutations while still living, often screaming in pain while doing so. Typical time to expire was one week after initial infection. The infection spread slowly through Vietnam, mostly among remnants of guerrilla fighters at first, and then eventually through to US troops that were still stationed along the beaches and in the jungles. Military leadership initially did not take reports of infection seriously, leading to higher rates of infection in the early days of the outbreak. Infection spread to neighboring countries after approximately two weeks, with infected individuals seemingly acting as a hive mind after gathering enough numbers. They would swarm cities in what appeared to be coordinated waves, attacking and infecting large groups of people and then retreating before mounting another attack hours later. This ensured that the living were slowly picked off, with the infection spreading exponentially as more and more joined the subject's ranks. Overseas transmission was accomplished by infected walking into the ocean. They did not appear to require respiration of any kind. Thus, they were able to walk across the ocean floor, and although at a slow rate, eventually move into other countries across bodies of water. Once on land, they would then seek out the nearest living being and begin the cycle. Humanity attempted multiple methods of killing the subjects, though none were shown to work. While gunshots to the head appeared to stop them temporarily, the subjects' bodies seemed to allow mutations which moved slower, more rudimentary brains to other parts of the body thus allowing basic survival and motor functions even with separation of the head. The only method found for complete and total destruction of the subject was burning to ash. The subject arrived in mainland America within three weeks of the first infection in Vietnam. Any word of the disease had been suppressed initially, with American troops and citizens being told that the infected were victims of a communist biological weapon. This facade was kept up in order for America to appear blameless in the use of biological and nuclear warfare, whereas meanwhile most other countries across mainland Europe and Asia were also dealing with their own outbreaks of the infection. Subjects spread across more of the earth in a matter of weeks, attacking and infecting anyone unfortunate enough to cross paths with carriers of the pathogen. Infected numbers grew exponentially in the first few days soon outnumbering humans at 10 to 1. The affected then began coordinated attacks on any surviving communities, systematically rooting out and turning any humans found. In a desperate final bid at eradicating the disease, the American military conducted bombing raids. Nuclear arms were dropped on hordes of infected as they traveled in packs. These attacks decimated a large amount of the infected population but it had unintended effects on those not destroyed by the initial blast. The radiation only strengthened the creatures, turning them into walking nuclear reactors. This in turn scorched any ground they came across, leaving fallout and infection in their wake. This also ensured that any human within range of subjects became infected simply through proximity. Agatha notes, two months after infection, 
Approximately 10,000 healthy humans are left on Earth. Most of them have been forced to adapt a nomadic lifestyle, constantly staying on the move to avoid roving groups of the infected. Cognizant will continue to monitor and update on the situation. Update 3-20-1978 Agatha reports 300 survivors remain, most having lost any hope to continue. Radiation is spread into most of the world's water supply, and storm systems spread nuclear fallout across the Earth. Agatha reported that the remaining humans are divided across the planet, with most believing they are the last remaining alive. The infected are still hunting, using their hive mind to develop a network across the world to find survivors. Update 4-7-1978 Agatha reports that the final human has been killed, opting to die by gunshot to the head instead of from the encroaching infected. We'll continue to monitor dimension for any sign of anomaly and potential aberrations, as well as research for any potential countermeasures and the events of aberration. I still can't believe any of this. It's so insane. How could Dad see all of this, deal with all of this and not go insane? No wonder he rarely came home. Facing these horrors had to change him. Until now, I've just been taking tapes off the top of the stack in the box and going on by one. I've gone through three layers of what I estimate to be about ten layers. And this is the point where I found something new. There was a large envelope, almost filled to bursting with papers. I opened it and I slid the pile out onto the floor. On top was another letter from Dad. Mark, I know what you've seen so far has been a lot to take in. These tapes, the case files, everything that's been in this box. I know I didn't sleep for weeks after being taken into the collective. I never knew there could be such terrors. Now, I'm honestly just happy to die and not have to worry about any of this. If there's a heaven or hell... It can't be as bad as the things that I've seen. What's enclosed in this envelope is twofold. There is a brief history of the collective. This entails the founding, how long we've known about the parallel worlds, the cognizance, and a brief history of who's who in the organization. You'll probably be surprised by the amount of famous historical figures that were more special than they had let on. The second part is an archive of high casualty aberrations that have crossed into our world. Many events throughout history were given a natural explanation, because the real reasons were far too much for ordinary humans to handle. There are things you'll learn here that will scare you, and honestly they should. Our world is not safe. No world is. Here is where I leave you. Again, I'm so sorry. Even now, as I write this letter, I'm tempted to take it all and burn it. Part of me wants you to continue living in ignorance, not knowing the horrors that lurk out in the world. The father in me wants to protect you. The scientist in me, though, knows that this research needs to continue. Someone has to do it, and I trusted more to someone that I know was smart enough to see the connections that I cannot. I love you. Dad. There is a case file along with an old newspaper clipping kept in a plastic sleeve. The paper was yellowed, and the print on it was faded to nearly nothing. I could see the edges disintegrating in the plastic. The headline read, Great Fire Devastates Chicago. There is a case file attached. The Great Chicago Fire. Cognizant Martin Ford and his partner were in the city of Chicago on their annual rounds when an aberration appeared in the city. Ford describes the being as being humanoid, but made of pure flame, burning white hot. Ford said he attempted to make contact with the creature, asking it of its intentions on our world and where it came from. The creature reportedly appeared uncaring of Ford's presence. Instead, looking around before finally touching the nearest building, setting it ablaze. Ford began to attempt to chase the aberration, 
trying to force it back through the dimensional tear that it came from. The creature did not acknowledge. Instead, it continued to move along the city streets, setting buildings afire as it went. Ford, thinking resourcefully, began to find whatever water he could around their immediate vicinity, dousing the aberration and beginning to force it towards Lake Michigan. Although they were moving the creature quickly towards the water, the fire continued to spread wherever it went. Teams of local firefighters scrambled immediately to fight the blaze. Finally, after a long struggle, the creature was cornered at the end of the port on Lake Michigan. In a heroic sacrifice, Ford's partner, Ezra Jennings, threw himself at the creature using Ford as his sight guide. Upon grabbing the aberration, he threw both it and himself into the lake, immediately killing the creature. Ford dove in after him, noting the near boiling temperature of the water as he dragged Jennings' body back to shore. Jennings' burns were beyond repair, and he expired seven hours after the aberration was destroyed. Let it be known that Ezra Jennings is receiving the highest accommodations the collective can give, as well as a hefty retirement sum being paid to his widow and family for future generations. He will also be memorialized in Collective HQ and archives as one of our most honored members. I want to throw up. It was one thing seeing these things that destroyed other worlds and realities. The fact that they could just stumble into our reality though, it terrifies me. This is why my dad gave me these files. These are things to watch out for. Things that nobody else can see. Hell, I can't even see them. I'm combing through whatever files I can. I may transcribe some if I think it's important. Some may deserve to stay as they are though. These things shouldn't be known. I'm torn if I should keep sharing these things. I don't want other people to know about these horrors. I barely slept in days, thinking that at any moment some cosmic terror could break through and destroy us, rending our minds into fragments. There'd be nothing we could do. I need to think on this. There's a lot left to go through but I may just stop here. I may do what my dad couldn't in Burnett. Maybe check myself in somewhere, or have a drink or twenty until I can forget. I keep hoping that I'll wake up, find out dad was really just your normal, everyday, absentee father. 
Maybe mom was still alive and I've dreamed the past decade of trauma. If I'm lucky, I'm actually dying. And this is all just the last illusions as my brain fires off every synapse until I die. Here we are though. I'm alive. You're alive. Who knows how long we'll stay that way. This will be my last update, at least for a while. I'm giving up on the tapes. The death and destruction, it's just too much. After this is uploaded, I'm going to set off and try to find the collective. I found something, a pattern. I'm afraid something big is about to happen. Something awful. I've gone through more videos. Some worse than others. There were more that were the typical apocalypse stuff that everyone expects. Earth's sun goes supernova. Biological and germ warfare kills the world. One was gone in an instant due to an accident at the Large Hadron Collider. The damn thing went off and took half the Earth with it, splitting the globe right down the middle and transporting one half just over two miles away from where it had started. Naturally, this was enough to cause instant death to the entire world due to gravitational shift. This last one though, I think it's literally hell. Hell coming to Earth and tearing our world apart for its own needs. I can only hope that it stays in that dimension, and we don't have a hell of our own. So, here's the case file with it. I managed to get the video transferred over as well though, with a few minor hiccups that came along with it. The tape wasn't in great shape, so this one is a bit more shaky than normal. After you read it, say a prayer. Our world will need it. Case, Carnival of Souls, 10-2-1987, Earth Designation, 00-666. Cognizant on duty today is Sun. Tune to the late night broadcast of Carnival of Souls on a local public access channel for Earth of U-666. Dimensional analysis and energy reports suggest a major cataclysmic event soon to take place. Current state of this earth is much like our own, with the exception that disco never happened and heavy metal came to be much sooner. As such, this earth has been experiencing their own version of the satanic panic since approximately 1977. In response to this, there has been a much greater focus on purging the nation of anything deemed evil. Book burnings and film burnings are rampant, with those caught possessing anything deemed unholy punished with torture and lengthy prison sentences. As such, a radical cult of Satanism has sprung up in protest. According to Sun, said cult was conducting an open protest at Capitol Hill, in which a pentagram was drawn on the outside courtyard. Worshippers then gathered around the symbol, chanting in what appeared to be Latin. Two minutes into the chant, they were attacked by riot police wielding shields and batons, who immediately began brutalizing the group. At least three protesters were killed, and several wounded. Some reports that the blood spilled during the encounter was absorbed by the pentagram, seemingly fueling a glowing light which began to emanate from the symbol. Cracks began to spread outward from it, eventually growing into fissures which opened underneath the group of protesters and counter-protesters caught nearby. These fissures reportedly sprang open very suddenly, not allowing anyone to escape. Fire was said to flow from the cracks as more and more humans were taken. The fissures closed after 10 minutes, leaving nearly no trace of being there. Violence began to resume amongst the gathered humans, with people from both sides attacking anyone and everyone within reach. Sun noted that the first ones to begin attacking were those that had been injured in the initial chaos, and those that were injured by them in the ensuing brawl then began to attack others, after freezing and convulsing for a moment. The brawl continued moving outward from there, with more and more humans becoming violent as they expanded to the outskirts of the city. By that evening, most of the DC area was in a full-blown riot. Sun noted that some who were attacked and hurt were not being overtaken as others have, depending on the severity of the injuries. 
Those attacking seemed to be focused on simply drawing blood, and anyone hurt beyond superficial wounds such as with broken bones or gaping wounds were simply left to bleed out or killed outright. Cases were noted of some of these victims being crucified on light poles, or dismembered and arranged in occult patterns by the attacking group. As the sun set over DC, the attackers began to bloom outward to the surrounding areas, aiming to move into surrounding cities. Smaller groups were left behind to roam the streets and weed out what humans were left in the capital. These roving gangs seemed more intent on terrorizing and slaughtering the survivors than turning them to their cause, frequently standing outside and taunting them before dragging them from their homes and brutally murdering anyone found. Sun was relieved of duty by trainee Cognizant Alexander the next morning due to shock. Sun had been monitoring the outer cities around the capital as the subject spread, and when deciding to check back on DC after a few hours, it should be noted here that Sun is currently six months pregnant with her first child. Upon looking back, she was greeted by the sight of multiple dead in the streets, homes painted red with blood, and any children and infants that had been found cut open and thrown over power lines between homes. Alexander resumed surveillance, noting that subjects had moved into the tri-state area and were commandeering cars, planes, and other vehicles in order to go further. The subjects referred to humanity as a filth, frequently claiming to be from hell, and referring to one another as a fallen. These descriptions coincide with the biblical description of demonic entities. After the second day, they had successfully taken the eastern seaboard and begun moving west across the United States. Some began commandeering aircraft and boats to move into other countries, while others crossed the Canadian border and began work there. Fallen that were moving west were noted to begin losing interest and appearing to become bored with how the operation was going. As such, they began disguising themselves as authority figures and other people in power in order to fool victims before killing them. It should be noted that across the world, more humans were becoming possessed at random, seemingly tied to wounds in the skin and blood being spilled. Though unconfirmed, there is belief that some world leaders were taken before anyone else in their country in a mass operation to let blood from citizens and perform acts of aggression against other countries attempting to start war. Some possessed were noted to eat parts of victims if they were deemed to be on saving. They did not seem to do this for any nourishment, but simply for pleasure and to defile. Multiple fallen were noted as recognizing each other in their human host, and speaking of how there were trillions of others still waiting to get a human host. One week from the initial riot, most countries are in complete disarray. There are less than 10 million living humans on Earth scattered across most countries. At some point, a beast rises from the Atlantic Ocean, fitting the biblical description of having seven heads. The creature glowed with an unholy black flame wafting from it, filling an immediate area with the smell of rot and sulfur. The beast stood tall, with its lower extremities almost reaching the lower atmospheric clouds. The beast was welcomed to shore near the Middle East by a tall, thin man, who at first glance appeared as an attractive woman or man, depending on the viewer, but upon a longer look, became a rotting corpse. Once they were united, the harlot climbed to the top of the beast, proceeding to perform various sexual acts for the beast, to see as it spewed fire and brimstone, covering the earth and cheering demons, the world became a hellscape of fire and death, with possessed humans shredding their skin and revealing the true form of the demons. Reptilian creatures with cloven hooves, large twisted horns, and flames bursting forth from every orifice. Earth 00-666 was deemed as a loss nine days after initial breach, with any humans left alive at the time being captured and tortured until death. Update 10-10-1987 Son has suffered a miscarriage. Update 10-15-1987 Alexander has requested a leave of absence in order to attend a seminary with a Catholic church.
Nope, uh, that's it. I'm done with these freaking tapes. Done with these transcripts. Done with anything dad left here. There's been a pattern showing in each world. One is ended each year without fail. Who's to say that ours won't be next? I need to find them. This collective. They have to have a map or something showing where these universes were in relation to ours. If I'm right, then we're due for an apocalyptic event soon, assuming it hasn't already started. I dumped everything out of the box finally. There is a paper on the bottom with an address. Somewhere in southern Georgia. Looks like the middle of nowhere. I'm heading out tomorrow. Until then, I'm leaving the papers and tapes here. Once I've spoken to them, I'm going to attempt to find some more information and hopefully find a way to prevent whatever messed up thing may happen to our world. Eventually, I'll try to scan everything in and upload it. These things have to be known. People need to see what's really happening in our world and be better equipped to fight it. I'll set up a site to dump all the info on when I finally can. In the meantime, I need to rest and make some final preparations. I don't know if this is what Dad had in mind. Me telling the world about the Collective and the terrors that lurked beyond our own world. But I hope he's proud. He may not have been there for me or my mom, but at least he was trying to save and protect us in his own weird way. I'm going to finish this. For him. Love you, Dad.